Some people are just born in the wrong era. Whether that be Jacob Rees-Mogg, who both physically and mentally belongs in the 1820s, or Jedward, who were clearly meant to have been born generations in the future, and the world just wasn't quite ready for their genius yet back in 2009, when they only finished sixth on the X Factor. The same is true of footballers. Liverpool were laughed at for paying £35 million for a 6 foot 4 inch human battering ram who would happily throw his head in front of a freight train in 2011, but in the 1950s, Andy Carroll would have had a nickname like Old Cannonhead and have been lauded as a generational talent. Likewise, Josip Ilicic had an impressive career in Serie A without ever playing for one of the league's big three, owing to his languid style and inconsistencies in an era of athletes and hyper-efficiencies, but his technical ability was sufficient for him to become a world-class old-school number 10 in the 1980s or 90s. Then you've got players who would have benefited for entirely different reasons. The likes of Michael Owen and the Brazilian Ronaldo, for example, with advancements in sports science and medical treatment, would likely have seen their careers at the highest level significantly extended if they played now. Neymar would most likely have gone down as an all-time great and the greatest player of his generation had he avoided the era of Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, and John Terry, Luis Suarez and John Yems could have avoided lengthy bans had they played in the 1950s, back when racism was still acceptable. Without further ado then, who undoubtedly would have been one of the greatest players of all time if he had only played in a future era where only a player's talents and accomplishments between the ages of 14 and 15 are taken into account, here are seven footballers, past or present, who played in the wrong era. 7. Ganso Ganso was the first player that I thought of when I read subscriber Patrick Van Stocken's suggestion for a video about footballers who played in the wrong era. Thank you for that, Patrick. I hope that you enjoy it. And he is the first inclusion in this seven. I would imagine that there are a fair number of people watching this who've never even heard of Ganso. But probably 14 or 15 years ago, there was incredible excitement about the Brazilian. He was being linked with virtually every super club in Europe, and he was up there as one of the best wonder kids on the game on at least one edition of Football Manager. It was no great mystery as to why that was the case. Phenomenally gifted, Ganso had all of the ability in the world with the ball at his feet, he possessed that classical effortless Brazilian flair and invention, and he began starring for Santos, a club that has produced more great players than just about any other, while still in his teens. Almost immediately, Ganso was compared to Kaká who won the Ballon d'Or, starred for AC Milan and Brazil, and joined Real Madrid for a world record-breaking fee around the same time that Ganso broke through with Santos and Brazil's under-20s. It was a valid comparison, in terms of their craft, flair, and technique, along with the positions that they played in, of course. But there were a couple of key differences, which set Kaká up to succeed in the modern era, and Ganso to desperately struggle. No, I don't mean God. For a start, Kaká was lightning quick, one of the fastest and most athletic midfields on the planet until injuries began to hit in Madrid, whereas Ganso lacked almost any discernible athleticism. He wasn't, and indeed still isn't, either quick or strong, his fitness and stamina have always been a problem, and, in part at least, probably as a consequence, he has been prone to injury at times. Ganso has also been criticised for his work rate, or lack thereof, inconsistency, and total absence of any meaningful defensive contributions. All of this is a problem for a footballer playing in the 21st century, and it is why Ganso has spent virtually his entire career in Brazil, his time in Europe with Sevilla and Amiens ended in failure, and he has only won eight caps for Brazil, the most recent of which came all the way back in 2012, when he was only 22 years old. Now age 34, Ganso is currently flourishing under Fernando Diniz at Fluminense, with whom he just won the Copa Libertadores. Ganso's performances under Denise, who is a throwback of a head coach, playing so-called relationist football rather than the more disciplined or athletic approaches adopted by most of the world's top teams over the last 20 years, provides a glimpse into what he could have achieved had he played in any era between the 1970s and 90s. The old school number 10, tasked primarily with passing, dribbling and linking play between midfield and attack, with little to no discipline or defensive responsibilities, has gone badly out of fashion, particularly in Europe. 
Were it still a prominent feature of the game at the highest level, the likes of Juan Roman Riquelme, Juan Mata, Mesut Ozil, and Paolo Dybala likely would have had glittering careers at the very highest level, and have been much more celebrated than they are. Whilst they all spent some time at the top, and were at one time at least lauded as world-class players, Ganso is perhaps the most extreme example of someone who probably could have won a Ballon d'Or in the 1980s, but couldn't even get a game at Sevilla in the 2010s, so I struggle to think of a better candidate than him to get us started. Sixth, Nick Pope. A bit of a heel change, I know, but the passage of time has really done Nick Pope dirty. Don't get me wrong, he is still the number one for a team that is currently 7th in the Premier League table, and earns over £3 million a year. I'm not asking for tears or a pity party here, but in previous generations, Pope would be unstoppable. When it comes to what one might once have termed the fundamentals of goalkeeping, Pope is absolutely rock solid. He is a towering and imposing figure between the sticks, commands his area brilliantly, has fantastic handling and reflexes, and is among the best shot stoppers in the game, particularly in one-on-one -on -one situations. Pope should be nailed on as England's number one, and sought after by every top team in the land. But he isn't. Instead, Pope joined Newcastle on a free transfer in 2022, having been relegated in his fifth season at Burnley, and not only has he won a grand total of just 10 caps for England, none of them at major tournaments, and none since 2022, he also can't even get in the squad at the moment. That's because, in a relatively short period of time, the demands on goalkeepers have radically changed. Pope might be great at goalkeeping, as we once understood it, but with the ball at his feet, he's abysmal. Again, that didn't used to be a problem. The fact that Pope's first touch is heavier than the Atlantic Ocean, and his distribution about as precise as an IDF bombing campaign, wouldn't have been a problem 20 or even only 10 years ago, back when David De Gea was still considered the standout keeper in the Premier League, despite suffering from the same inadequacies albeit to nowhere near the same extent. Whenever Jordan Pickford made a blunder for Everton a couple of years ago, despite being excellent for England, there would be renewed calls for Gareth Southgate to start Nick Pope ahead of him. I haven't really heard anyone make those same calls since Pope's last two England appearances against Italy and Germany in September 2022, where he soiled his undergarments every time he received the ball to feet and was closed down, leading to one of Germany's goals. Ultimately, however good he may be at keeping the ball out of his own net, Pope undermined the way in which Southgate wanted England to build up from the back and control a game. That's why he may well never win another cap for England, he'll likely never play for another club other than Newcastle in the Champions League, and it is feasible that Newcastle United may even look to replace him at some stage, should they seek to switch up their own approach play and become more progressive. Thanks, Neuer, Allison, and Edison. Pope's crying now. I hope that you're pleased with yourselves. I think the likes of Napoli's Alex Mere, Leon's Anthony Lopez, and Bournemouth's Neto have also suffered as a result of the rise of the sweeper keeper and increased demands placed on goalkeepers, but none more so than Pope, which is why he features in sixth. Fifth, Class Jan Huntelaar. As with a few players in this seven, despite playing in the wrong era, as I'm claiming, Klaas Jan Huntelaar still had an excellent career. He is literally the third highest scorer in the history of the Dutch national team, with a better goals per game ratio than Patrick Kluivert, Robin van Persie, and Ruud van Nistelrooy. Likewise, Ganso has played for Brazil and won two Libertadores crowns, and Nick Pope has played for England and in the Champions League. There is no one in this seven who played non-league football in the generations that they played in, who I'm claiming would have won multiple Ballon d'Ors if only they had been born at a different time. I would make the case, however, that had he been born a generation or two earlier, Klaas Jan Huntelaar most likely would have spent his prime years at least in Ballon d'Or contention. When he actually played, the Dutchman was never even nominated. A lethal finisher with a precise first touch, speaking about Huntelaar in 2009, legendary Dutch head coach Lou van Gaal stated, quote, In the penalty area, he is the best player in the world, bar none. End quote. Big, strong, and a genius in terms of his movement, it was almost as though Huntelaar had been genetically engineered in a lab by a mad scientist in pursuit of creating the perfect poacher. 
All he lacked on that front, perhaps, was searing pace. But other than that, he had it all, and that's reflected in the number of goals that he scored. In only his second season playing in the Eredivisie for Heeren, Vane and Ajax, Huntelaar scored 33 goals in 31 games. He scored a goal once every 80 minutes over the course of an entire season. That is basically the same level of output as Erling Haaland last season. In three years at Ajax in total, Huntelaar scored 105 goals in 136 games, which resulted in a potential €27 million Euro move to Real Madrid. Huntelaar is often labelled as a flop for his time in Madrid, where he only lasted six months. But it is just worth noting that he scored eight goals in 13 starts during those six months, which is hardly a shameful record. In the summer of 2009, after Huntelaar's half-season in Madrid, Kaká, Karim Benzema and Cristiano Ronaldo arrived. It reflected the direction that football was going in at the time. Benzema, who would replace Huntelaar up front, was a workhorse and a brilliant provider. Meanwhile, Ronaldo, despite playing on the left wing, would be their chief goalscorer. It wasn't that Huntelaar wasn't good enough per se, it was that his profile was no longer accommodated by the world's biggest and best clubs. Things would be even worse at AC Milan, Huntelaar's next club, who inexplicably played him on the wing a handful of times, which is a bit like playing Ganso in a box-to-box -box role, or Nick Pope as a number 10. Huntelaar was eventually accommodated at Schalke, where he took just five seasons to become the club's second highest scorer of all time, and then back at Ajax, where Huntelaar sits sixth in the club's all-time scoring charts, despite playing the fewest number of games out of anyone in that top six. The death, or at least near extinction, of the poacher during Huntelaar's playing days, during the late 2000s and throughout the 2010s, meant that that was probably as good as it was ever going to get for him. Had Huntelaar played just a single generation earlier, when you look at someone like Filippo Inzaghi, who was probably the last truly great poacher to be tolerated by a super club, AC Milan certainly never played him on the wing, I think he probably could have made a success of it at any club in the world. It will be interesting to see, over 30 years since Inzaghi began his career, whether Erling Haaland can spark a poacher revival, especially succeeding under Pep Guardiola, a man who would have seemed so averse to that hyper-specialised profile of player just a few years ago, or whether the Nordic meat shield is just an exception unto himself. A word to Chiro Mobile and, possibly, Javier Hernandez, who also suffered from poachers going extinct, but I think Huntelaar is the most notable example. Fourth, Mark Albrighton. Mark Albrighton has won a Premier League title, the FA Cup, played in the Champions League, and amassed in excess of 300 Premier League appearances. He has had a hugely distinguished career then, but I can't help but think that, in another generation, he could have been so much more. You're laughing. I've said Mark Albrighton could have done more than winning the Premier League and playing in the Champions League in another era and you're laughing. At least allow me to flesh out my hypothesis. Albrighton has never been the flashiest or most prolific of wide players, to put it mildly, and I think that's always led, at least outside of Leicester City fans, to people underrating his abilities. When I say Albrighton has never been the most prolific, I mean it. His most prolific season was actually his breakout campaign at Aston Villa, aged only 21, in which he scored five Premier League goals and six in all competitions. During his 10 seasons at Leicester City, in which he has made more than 300 appearances, he has scored a grand total of 19 goals and a record best tally of four in the 2016-17 season. That's highly unusual for a winger as distinguished as Albrighton in the modern game, as is his lack of speed, flair, or willingness to take players on. Albrighton is what one could term an old-school wide midfielder, hence his inclusion in this seven. One of the finest crosses of a ball in the Premier League for more than a decade, Albrighton is much more suited to playing either wide left or right in a four- or five-man midfield. That is where he played, typically on the left of a four alongside Riyad Mahrez, Danny Drinkwater and N'Golo Kante, when Leicester won the 2015-16 Premier League title. 
In some ways, All Brighton is reminiscent of an old school 1990s or 2000s English wide player like David Beckham, who flourished in a 4 4 2. Like Beckham, All Brighton rarely takes on his man, rarely scores from open play, has great vision and an excellent weight of pass, and he loves to get his head down and whip a ball into the box, making him a dream for a centre forward. Unfortunately for All Brighton, wide midfielders and the 4 4 2 formation itself went broadly out of fashion just as his career was getting going, replaced by 4 2 3 1s and 4 3 3s with much more advanced wide players with an entirely different set of attributes and expectations. As a result, no top team was ever likely to touch him without an obvious role for him, he has never won an England cap, and he has sometimes been deployed as a modern day wingback, which resembles the role of an old school wide midfielder much more closely than modern day wingers in a front three, who are, effectively, just wide forwards. All Brighton is interesting because I can't think of too many players like him in the modern era who've actually tried to play as wide midfielders. Most players in his mould, I suspect, have just been retrained as either central midfield playmakers or attacking fullbacks or wingbacks. Before someone says it in the comments, I'm not saying that All Brighton would have been as good as Beckham in another era, but he would have been good enough to play consistently, I think, for an English team in the Champions League rather than only for a single season, and probably would have won 30 to 40 England caps rather than zero. Third. Lakdar Balumi. There are some players who didn't necessarily play in the wrong era, or not solely at least, they were just born in the wrong place. Glenn Hoddle, for example, probably played in the perfect era as a supremely skilled playmaker. He was just born and played in a country, England, which didn't appreciate or utilise his talents as well as they could. The Greek Maradona, Vasilis Hatsopanagis likewise, had the misfortune of being born to Greek political refugees in the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic and ended up getting tied down to a lifetime contract with Heraklis, despite interest from some of Europe's biggest clubs. Meanwhile, Hungary's golden generation were prevented from leaving the country to go anywhere and then banned from football for two years following the 1956 uprising and Sweden's greatest ever players were thwarted by the country not allowing professionals to represent them, meaning that they were forced to choose between having careers in the game or representing the national team. Oh, and of course, any women footballers who played before about the 1990s. In Lakdar Balumi's case, he was born in the wrong place and in the wrong generation. Nicknamed the Wizard of Maghreb, owing to his spellbinding flair and invention with a ball at his feet, it is a crime that Balumi's talents have been distilled to a single moment in most people's consciousness. That moment came at the 1982 World Cup, where his skill beguiled the West Germany defence, and he scored the winning goal in what was West Germany and Algeria's opening game of the tournament, and is still one of the greatest World Cup upsets of all time. There are worse things to be remembered for, but for someone as talented as Balumi, one goal could never do him justice. When the IFFHS compiled their list of the 100 greatest African footballers of the century, Balumi came fourth, the highest ranked of any North African. Whereas today, Algeria's best players star on the biggest stages at club level, when Balumi began his career in the late 1970s, he wasn't allowed to leave Algeria. Barcelona tried to sign him in 1982, but the law prevented him from moving until he was 27. In 1985, the year that Balumi turned 27, Juventus came calling, only for the deal to be scuppered after Balumi broke his leg. In the end, the only club that Balumi played for outside of Algeria was six games for Al Arabi in Qatar. He still won 147 caps and scored 34 goals for Algeria, making him the country's all-time record appearance holder and a national hero. But Balumi's talents ought to have made him a global icon, and had he played now, they almost certainly would have. Second, Jose Luis Chilavat. Few roles have changed as radically as that of goalkeepers in recent generations, which is why two of them feature in this seven. From the 1970s through to the early 2000s, there were a whole host of so-called El Loco Latin American goalkeepers. 
El Loco means crazy or mad, and it was a fitting description for the likes of Mexico's George Campos, Peru's Ramon Caraga, Argentina's Hugo Gatti, and of course, Colombia's René Higuita. Famed in England for performing a scorpion kick to keep out a shot by Jamie Redknapp at Wembley Stadium. They were all brilliant goalkeepers who won between 18 to 129 caps for their countries respectively, but there was a sense in which, certainly from the European perspective, which became more significant into the 1990s as the economics of world football shifted, they were viewed as being a bit of a novelty, as though they were eccentric and mad first, an excellent goalkeeper second, or even not at all. If any of them played now, however, I suspect that they'd be treated very differently. Edison, for example, might have been considered an El Loco goalkeeper if he played in the Premier League during the 1990s or in the English First Division during the 80s. In fact, I'm almost certain that he would, and therefore, as a bit of a liability. In the modern game, by contrast, he is hailed as being one of the best in the business, despite being a little bit lax at times, in terms of what I earlier described, as being the goalkeeping fundamentals. And as a vital tool in Manchester City's arsenal, with regards to how they want to play the game, and build up from the back. By the same token, I think the El Loco goalkeepers, if they played now, would be some of the most prized assets in world football. Higita's scorpion kick and other antics might not go down too well with a manager like Sean Dyche, and the fact that George Campos was only 5 feet and 6 inches tall would have hurt him as a goalkeeper in any era since the 1930s, but the Prince of Paraguay, Jose Luis Chilavert, would probably be considered one of, if not, the best goalkeeper in the world. Chilavert had fantastic reflexes and handling. He was big enough at six foot two, vocal, commanding, aggressive, and, as his nickname suggests, just a little bit mad. As well as being a three-time IFF HS World Goalkeeper of the Year, Chilavert is also the second highest scoring professional goalkeeper of all time behind Rogerio Chetty, having scored 59 goals at club level at eight for Paraguay, owing to his ability from set pieces. Chilavert's ability with the ball at his feet, which was genuinely outstanding, his free kicks were brilliant by anyone's standards, not just for a keeper, wouldn't be considered just as a useful quirk in the modern game as it was in the 80s or 90s, but as an incredibly useful asset to any of the world's leading clubs. Chilavert had an exceptional career in Argentina, it must be said, but only spent five seasons in Europe, three with Zaragoza in La Liga and two with Strasbourg in Ligue 1 and Ligue 2. If he played now, I think that he would most likely spend almost his entire career in Europe, and rather than playing for a middling La Liga team and a yo-yo club in France, it would be for a Real Madrid, Barcelona, or PSG. First, Leandro Cabrera. Poor old Leandro Cabrera. Age 32, his career has been split between playing in La Liga and the Segunda Division for either promotion-chasing or relegation-threatened teams, most notably Zaragoza, Getafe, and Espanyol. Which is probably why, when I just said, first, Leandro Cabrera, about half of you, will have thought to yourselves, who? It's a perfectly reasonable response. Unless you pay quite close attention to La Liga, then why would you have heard of a veteran centre-back at a mid-table club? Leandro Cabrera is one of the most generationally unfortunate footballers of all time, though. A big, strong, 6-foot-3-inch athletic centre-back who is airily dominant, a tight man marker, and formidable in the tackle, there was a time when that would have made Cabrera one of the most revered defenders on the planet. The man defends as formidably as the Irish A Company in the Siege of Yad at Val, so stick him in just about any super team in the 1980s or 90s, with the possible exception of Cruyff's dream team, and he wouldn't look remotely out of place. Unfortunately for Cabrera, in recent years, some sick and twisted characters have come into football, demanding that defenders not only defend well, but could also play football. You know, stuff like being able to trap a ball and play a 10-yard pass. It is a cruel development which has deprived Cabrera of becoming a potential Champions League winner who could have won 100 caps for Uruguay and has instead turned him into a mid-table or even relegation threat to nobody who has never won a single cap for his national team. 
There are, of course, still lots of centre-backs who are old-school stoppers with weak technical abilities. I am thinking of the likes of Craig Dawson, Chris Smalling, or Chaglar Soyuncu, but none of them are anywhere near as bad with a ball at their feet as Cabrera, who sometimes appears never to have kicked a ball before in his life. I'm not even being unkind, it is just an honest assessment. And, if anything, it illustrates just how good his work rate and defensive credentials are that he has still carved out a top-flight career with all of the skill and finesse with the ball at his feet of a blind elephant overdosing on Red Bull and MDMA. Anyway, on that note, that is just about it for today's video. This was a fun one, so thank you, Patrick, and I could just as easily have named an entirely different seven of players from my shortlist, but... I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. I apologise if I sound a bit off. Might have COVID. Haven't done a test yet, but uh, not feeling great. But yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, it goes without saying, make sure that you're subscribed and have notifications turned on both for this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one, where I sound a bit less ill. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or Threads via the username at HITC7s on all three. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.